All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jack Johnson, and as you can see, I'm the manager of the Mark Monitor Security Operations Center. Mark Monitor is a brand protection company uh, worldwide, and pretty much what my team and I do, we, do, we, ma we manage the anti-fraud product. So we provide uh, social engineering mitigation for Fortune 500 uh, financial institutions, as well as as well as well uh, online gaming providers, et cetera. This is very weird. <laughs> but <laughs> so, to, so today, I'm going to talk to you guys about creating a cyber threat actor, actor attribution program. And I just want to be clear before I start is that I'm going to talk about two, three different aspects. The first aspect is the processes that you would need to do inside of an organization to get this rolling. And what I mean by program is there's some uh, authorizations and permissions you need with inside your organization before you can start collecting information from employees, et cetera. So this is something, anybody recognize what this means, what this stuff is? It's Morse code. In my former life, I spent eight years in the United States Navy as a crypto cryptologic technician. And one of, pretty much I was a SIGINT operator, signals interceptor, and been all over the world, two six-month Westpac deployments, et cetera. But what we would do is we would monitor communications and I basically, I cop copy Morse code for eight or 12 hours a day, every day. Pretty boring, right? So to keep it from getting boring, what we would do is we would actually start identifying the person on the other side who's submitting the, the Morse code because you would learn their rhythms, their patterns, their habits because Morse code is very rhythmic. Even we could start diagnosing and figuring out if the person is having an off day because you would say, man, this guy's sloppy today. Like, he's driving me nuts. You can't tell a dip from a da, his dashes are off, etc. Even some people will go even further to start making up scenarios like, I bet you he was arguing with his wife last night, or this guy is drunk again, etc. Too much vodka. So if you can think of what country we were doing, dealing with. But this quote that I just translated is from Sun Tzu, famous Chinese, you know, strategician. Uh, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. And this is what the focus of our attribution program is. Identifying the threat actor is what everyone's mind goes to when you say attribution. You want to know who he is. That's important. But what's even more beneficial on a regular basis is understanding their habits and their tactics of how they're launching their attacks and what's their end game. Because if you can understand what's their end game, then you know, you know where their, where, where, where their attack points are and how to defeat against it. That was interesting. Okay, so I like definitions. I already went through. We're going to talk about a program. And what I want to set, uh, focus on on the program is an aspect that talk about a set of related measures, events, and activities with a particular long-term aim. Because cyber threat, act, threat actors, hackers, whatever you call it, they're in this to win it. You know, I managed 26 analysts in the Security Operations Center with 24 by 7, 365. I've been there since 2004, 12 years. The social engineering attacks, phishing, malware, vishing, is just going up. And I'll show you some stats later to prove that. So whenever I, you know, onboard a new analyst, I like to tell people that today, information security, it's not a, a job, it's not a career, it's a lifestyle. It's something, you know, I take it home with me. I, I get calls, emails 24 hours a day because it doesn't stop. We just had the busiest weekend ever because of Black Friday going into Cyber Monday. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, explosive. So what we did in our organization, we pretty much, we detect the phishing sites or malware sites and we take them offline. But customers always want more, right? You never had a customer that is satisfying, like, man, this product hasn't evolved in 10 years, but I still love it. No, that's not the case. So our customers are always like, can we do something more? Or one of my customers that I worked with for a long time, credit card issuer, he's like, I wish I knew who's behind this stuff. I just, just wish I knew more about the perk, perk. So I took that to heart and we started talking and, and I talked to my management and said, there is more we can do. But it's a thin line between legal and illegal once you start kind of getting into the deep end of the pool. So we went through, we got C-level management, IT security, got authorization from everyone, and then we said, okay, this is what we need to do. We need to start collecting information so that we can kind of analyze it and see what's going on. 
And we also extend this out to our customers and offer them additional help. But you just need permissions and you need to talk to your legal department to make sure that everything we're doing is clear so that no one's going to get in trouble. This is an example of a social engineering attack that was launched against one of the Democratic headquarter uh, key people for this uh, 2016 election. And what you'll notice is that they sent them a bit.ly link that was mimicking a Gmail account and there was only two clicks in 2016. This is what you call a spear phishing attack. This means that the first click was the actual threat actor testing the phishing site and the second click was the victim. This is how pinpoint accurate their attacks are. This is why the attribution aspect is very critical because you don't have a lot of time these days to, you know, get your hands around the problem. They hit and then they get what they want. They expose this guy's emails, etc. Here's another example. This is what we call the business email compromise or the CEO uh, scam, where a cable giant, the CFO received an email, he transferred 40 million euros. I mean, this is the kind of impact that it will have. And when you're speaking to your executive management or your management in general, when you want to invest time, time is money. But if you show them facts and figures like this, it kind of gets their air and they're willing to participate. So to make it work, you need, you know, permission. You got to put your protocols in place, procedures, processes. And then you have a program. I call this the five P's. Then to make it work, this is getting to where I really want to go. I had a team of engineers and analysts that we started working together in 2014. We hired a new guy and a couple of other analysts like really leveled up. They were you know, studying for their CEH, getting into pen testing, rainbow tables, all this stuff. So we sat together and kind of came up with a new game plan to see if we could start identifying these threat actors by behavioral characteristics and other identical char characteristics that we'll be able to identify. Them. So social engineering, it all starts what we call fishing. So I like to ask everyone this, what's a fish? Because whenever I ask someone what's a fish, I get like, it's a, like a website or a link that you get or somebody suspicious. Where the reality is, you're the fish. Cyber threat actors are trying to snare you and I. We're the ones who have the credentials, the passwords, the usernames, the access. We have the credit card numbers. This is where they're trying to catch. Here's some stats. So if you look, the financial industry comp compromises 38% of all social engineering attacks, phishing and malware. If this would have been three years ago, it would have been maybe 80%. And if you notice, ISP hosting and retail are taking up a lot of the pie now. The reason for this is that ISPs and hosting providers also include email providers. A lot of the social engineering attacks today are not brand specific targeting, meaning they're not asking for your banking account right out, out, right out front as much as they used to. Because today, a lot of uh, sites authenticate with your personal email address. So this is where the uh, threat actors have pivoted, and now they're going after your personal accounts. Because if you think about any social networking site that you authenticate on, you use your personal email account, a lot of banks, et cetera. So let's look at these numbers. So you see Dropbox and Google. In 2014, our security operations center, we detected eight Dropbox sites. If you look into 2015, it's you know, 50,000 coming in 2016 is almost, is over 100,000. But look at Google. Google exploded because Google has Gmail. You have your Google Drive. You also have your Android devices that authenticate. Not, a lot of people are not aware that you can go through the web version of the Google Marketplace or Play Store and install apps onto your phone. This is an avenue for malware infections, and most users and even security professionals aren't even aware of this is how these unauthorized third-party apps are getting installed. It's not that users are going to these websites and installing these APKs. The threat actors, once they have their credentials, are installing them themselves, and a the user will never know that the app was there. So what we do 
is we monitor communication channels. This includes email, SMS, voice over IP, et cetera. This is how we, we monitor the pathways and then we intercept the communications and then we can start building our program. We also monitor internal data sources. So users are your greatest asset. If, if you build a network of users and they understand what they should do when they receive something suspicious, you will be amazed at the amount of data that you can receive and collect on a daily basis. Also, it's important for users to know that they should forward suspicious communications from their personal accounts. Because this is, you know, people are checking their Yahoo, their Gmail, their Facebook, their Twitter accounts at work, on work machines. So you can lock down your corporate environment, your exchange server, which what have you, but there's still different conduits to come in. External data sources. These are open source intelligence feeds, uh, fish tank, you have MIS uh, accounts, uh, you have NGOs, APWG, uh, MOG, you have all these organizations who are collecting all this information that you can sign up, partner with, and they'll put you in part of their data exchange. You also have your trusted communities. If you're a cybersecurity professional today, there is definitely strength in numbers. You, you cannot work in a vacuum or in a silo and be successful because your attacks are probably the same as your attacks, and I'm saying the same attacks, but we're not talking. Threat actors are definitely talking because they're in the underground forums, dark web, et cetera, sharing information. So here, when we get into the attribu attribution aspect, what we notice in some of the attacks is that the attackers launch the attacks at the same time. So one attack, it was a malware uh, actor. We noticed that. He, he, he sent the messages the same time. So through research, we figured out that they're in Mexico through the time that he's active. Also, it's a reflection on how much intelligence they have on your organization, depending on what time they try to hit you. So I'm not a poker player, but I like this philosophy. So poker is a game based on information availability. And what I really took away from this quote by David Sassaman is that there's poker tales. Threat actors have tails as well. And it can tell you a lot about their skill level, et cetera, based on how they conduct their business. So you have betting patterns and physical tails. You see when you watch the World Series of Poker, all the guys are doing these weird things to obfuscate their behavior because they don't want to know, they don't want to reveal when they have a good hand or a bad hand. Threat actors are doing the same thing, it's just in cyberspace. So. Hacker tells, behaviors and habits, periods of activity, automation. So sometimes we'll detect a massive uh, phishing attack where someone puts up 50 phishing sites. We take them offline, they come back in a minute. That threat actor is highly organized and they're automating. They also, they're monitoring their, you know, stuff. Human limitations, you know, everyone including myself, we have resources and personal life. My knowledge is a limiting factor. But if I partner with you and you're good in a certain area of technology, I can really level up pretty quickly. So also the, the, the imagination. We look at their resources. So today, it's very easy to get into cybercrime because ransomware as a service, malware as a service, they even have phishing as a service. Example of a ransomware as a service is Lockheed. Lockheed author only takes 15% of the profit, where anyone who distributes a Lockheed malware receives 80% of the ransomware, 80 to 85%. And also we look at attack habits. So some threat actors, they like to pop WordPress sites through the plugins. Uh, some people break into all CMS systems. That's your Joomla, your WordPress, your Drupal. We see guys, they love breaking into C panels, the control panels, the control servers. SQL injections, very popular, and then PHP web shells and redirectors. PHP web shells are awesome because they, if you're familiar with a web shell, once it's installed, it just gives you root access to the box through a web browser. All right, here's an example of a PHP shell. And you can see it has permissions and directories. You just click and browse it. You don't even have to know Linux to do this. All right, so now I'm going to get to the part that you guys really want to hear about. So now we're going to get into some attribution. In 2014, we teamed up with uh, 
a, an investigative group that said that they can identify hackers. So I was like, okay, I got the perfect guy for you. Because we have been building, uh, not a case, but building a database of, of threat actors. And I said, this guy is super prolific, and I would love to know who he is. So we kind of build our database by collecting the social engineering lures, because they, this is the evidence that they leave behind. Think of it like we're a crime scene investigator. When they send you a malware binary, they're exposing themselves because the binary is now in your possession. And there's also a lot of forensic evidence in binaries. Uh, one thing about hackers and social engineering attackers in general, they hate white space. So anytime there's white space in a file, et cetera, they'll put something in it. Sometimes they put their name, sometimes they put a certain character sequence or something. It's like almost like bubble wrap. People cannot resist it and not pop it. One thing I want to caution against is collecting too much information. You want, I, just, I know I'm like kind of contradicting myself because I said you need all the information you can, but you have to organize it or you'll be overwhelmed. If you see in the next example, these are phishing kits that we collected from a threat actor just for two days, the individual. This is how busy he is. So collected the files, extract them, and I look through all the text files, search through it. I just do a grep. I'm not manually looking through. But we find common strings. And one common string that popped out is he was kind enough to tell us who created it because he wants props. And also, once the user hits submit, the email addresses goes here. This is very important. This line right there created by, it's evidence, but it's not as damning or identifiable as the email address because the email address is where he's going to receive the stolen credentials. So from attack to attack to attack, if you see that's the same, it's the same threat actor. I don't think they're sharing email accounts to do this stuff. So once I built up enough of, of these examples, I put it into a spreadsheet, and this is truncated. The spreadsheet is thousands of rows. And what jumped out at me is that through all of these entries, there's a couple email addresses. These are all the same, the Yandex one. This one was different, and then this one at the bottom is different. And if you look at the file names he used, they're all the same except for this example and this example. So what that showed us is that he has at the time, three unique fish kits that he's using. The one with loop PHP is the prevalent one. Next, I put it into Maltigo and did a visual graph of it. And what this shows you is that there's two different brands. The, the first one is a major shipping uh, organization, and the second one was Yahoo. So we saw that he actually pivoted out. And this guy, was he was attacking, he targets all the major shipping organizations, but then we notice he's targeting Yahoo. This was 2014, around October, so this is when we start seeing the shift into the uh, free mail, email accounts. So this was the, the beginning of when we started seeing it. The red balls, these, were, these are incident IDs because this is a customer, so we actually created tickets and enforced on them. The yellow row is, are the unique URLs. And then you see the fish kit, so we saw clusters. I don't know if you guys use Montego. And at the bottom, those are the three unique emails of where he was shipping the data. So through all this information, we were able to use investigative tools to try to see now that we have all this information, can we attribute them? So we use central ops or domain tools. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but you can uh, look up uh, who is records, network who is records, DNS servers records, uh, passive DNS. Passive DNS is great because you can look up historical who has records. Because uh, I, I meant to include an example. Just yesterday, one of my analysts came up and said, I think I got another threat actor. Because what he noticed is that the who is record for a domain that was registered, a, a lookalike domain where it's like Google with three O's, et cetera, someone had registered it and sent out phishing uh, mess messages. But then we noticed that the who is went private. So I said the guy must have slipped up when he first registered the domain, and, and then it changed to private. But through passive DNS or any kind of historical who is record system, you can look at it. Clear and accurate are uh, tech, uh, services that allow you to basically, uh, it's not like a background check on a person, but you can look up search on people. 
And Spokio is a free, is not a free version, but it's a cheaper version of the same thing. Clear is what I use for this investigation because we were part of Thompson Reuters at the time and it's a Thompson Reuters uh, investigative services product and this is the guys who came and told me they could do it. So this is Hacker Dread. We were able to fully identify everything about him. He's a Nigerian national. We have his date of birth. We got his Facebook account, Twitter account, LinkedIn account. And we've been able to successfully do this on multiple numerous threat actors again and again. Because once we built the program and put everything in place to make sure that now we have the information coming in, we're organizing the information and structure into a database, and now we can query, we can see the prominent threat actors and who's the big targets, we go after them, and it's, it's like one, two, three now. At one point, People thought it was impossible to go after these Nigerians because they're in Nigeria. The Nigerian government, through efforts with law enforcement, the FBI primarily, stepped their game up, resulting in August 1st, you see this, the end of the $60 million scam, voila. That's where we're going. What we need to do is make ourselves a hard target, meaning they put these sites up, they send them malware, shut them down immediately. Let them know that you're not just going to take it. Then we need to go after them and take them offline permanently. That's it. Anybody got any questions? All right. Thank you. <laughs>